Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to our uh, webinar on color in vacation and travel photography. Uh, my name is Dave Cardinal. I'm a, a travel, and, uh, travel and nature photographer. I work a lot with both of our two sponsors today. We're happy to have both of them with us. Uh, Patty Shank is here from Data Color. Uh, along with Oliver from their customer support organization who will be uh, managing the question and answer uh, period for us later. And our other sponsor, DxO Labs. Um, both sponsors have contributed some special offers for you guys and we'll have a giveaway at the end. Um, so people are still trickling into the room, so I'm not going to race too quickly to get started because uh, I don't want to cut people off, but uh, we'll go into it a little bit here. Um, I'm happy you're all with us. I want to cover f four main pieces of what it takes to really master color in your travel and vacation photography, uh, with obviously a fairly heavy emphasis on color management, um, and that's a, a big part of what uh, Data Color provides. Um, and then also ways to get better color out of your images. And then, um, so we'll talk about how to create a color managed workflow, and then we'll talk about how to use that color managed workflow correctly so that you're taking full advantage of it. Um, there's a lot of errors that can creep into people's image processing if they're not careful. Um, then we'll, third, we'll talk about going beyond that to color enhancement essentially to getting great color that, that may go beyond a color management workflow. Um, and then fourth we'll talk about some quick ways to troubleshoot color issues with images because it's really easy to go astray by misidentifying the problem with an image and if you fix the wrong thing uh, then often you just make it worse. Uh, and then finally, and, and perhaps most excitingly, uh, we'll, we'll take questions, uh, we'll do a giveaway, we're giving away Spider 5, and I'll tell you about some special offers uh, for attendees from Data Color and from DxO Labs. So that's what we've got going, and uh, then we'll, we'll get started here. Um, I should mention, uh, before I go in, what we'll do is, um, as far as questions, um, we won't answer those till towards the end, because that way we'll get questions that, uh, that don't just refer to things we already addressed. Uh, so we'll throw it open to questions, and, and Oliver will manage that, and, and he and I will be answering them, depending upon uh, whether they're questions that are specific to data color or more general questions about how I do my work and my workflow. Okay, so first let's talk about color management, and uh, some of you I'm sure are very familiar with it. Some may already be existing uh, data color customers or uh, competitors' customers, uh, but let's review for you and make sure you're taking full advantage of all the possibilities, and for others of you who are curious about it, obviously uh, this will be a learning experience. We can, we can talk about it in all its uh, elements. But, the thing about color management is that it's a system designed to give you accurate um, and quality color all the way from the beginning to the end of your workflow. So those are slightly two different things. You want your color to be accurate, but you also want to take the best possible advantage of each of your devices. And every device has its own set of colors it can reproduce. It has its own set of tones it can reproduce. A uh, smartphone camera can't produce nearly the same set of colors or tones that a $3,000 DSLR can. Um, but a workflow may include both of those cameras and lots of different printers and lots of different monitors. So color management was invented to try and harness all of that and do the best job you can of making things flow from one to another to another. And so ideally you want to color manage your entire workflow starting with your camera and your laptop uh, if you use it in the field um, or your your tablet, which unfortunately the tablet color management is is a is a tricky um, thing and because many of them don't run a, a full operating system. 
Uh, then your monitor, if you have a computer or more at home. Projectors, if you're showing slides, that might be an HDTV as a, used as a projector, or it might be a real projector. And then if you print locally um, or share on the web, and we'll talk about all of that. So the first goal is accurate color reproduction. Uh, but that's also a really good starting point for what we'll talk about later, where we want to go beyond accurate and create really pleasing, memorable color. Um, but you have to have a baseline first in order to do that. So color management, we'll talk about each of these elements. It starts with doing it in the camera. Um, and then you've got your laptop monitors, projector, and printer, which are all kind of a group. That gives you a workflow. Then you need to know how to take advantage of that workflow in your applications, uh, which we'll talk about for some of the major applications like Photoshop, Lightroom, Optics Pro, and FilmPack. And finally, that doesn't do you any good until somebody actually sees your image. So how do you share, print, and uh, use online services is affected by your color management workflow as well. Now, color management for your camera is is where everything starts. It's probably one of the harder ones for most people to actually implement. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about how it works and what it does for you. Now, if you shoot RAW in your camera or uh, mobile device even now with some of the newer mobile devices, your RAW converter is essentially got a profile that somebody built at that company, at DxO or Adobe typically, that um, takes the raw data from the camera and converts it into a known, what they call a color space or a known set of colors. So fortunately, the scientists at those companies have done most of this work for you if you shoot raw. Now, if you shoot JPEG, um, or TIFF for that matter, but most people don't shoot in that mode. But if you shoot JPEG, you get to make that decision at the time you shoot. And most cameras these days have a choice of two. They either have sRGB, uh, which is a consumer level, very standard color space. Um, it's very simple. If you're in doubt, it's a great default choice. A lot of people, for many people, it's the only color space they ever use because um, they don't have to do any further processing to it if they don't want to. At a higher level, Adobe RGB is also a setting for JPEGs and most of the higher end cameras. And that gives you a broader range of colors, but, and we'll talk about why this is true. Everything you shoot in Adobe RGB needs to be converted before you just go willy nilly posting it to the web or emailing it to friends or else it's gonna look fairly drab. Uh, so there's, that's all you really have to know about color management in your cameras. Pick between RAW and JPEG, and then if you're JPEG, pick between sRGB and Adobe RGB. And we'll, we'll talk about the differences in a little bit. Now there are a couple helpful tools from Data Color um, that can give you it, uh, advanced or additional capabilities that I'll mention here. One, on the top you see a picture of the spider checker tar target. Uh, what the spider checker does is give you an ability to do a couple things. The first is to see how your camera is rendering color in a given scene under particular lighting conditions. And the second is you can actually use it to create a custom color profile for your camera for uh, Photoshop or Lightroom. And even though those products have a profile for your camera, it may not be accurate under every lighting condition. So you can actually go one step further if you want to maximize value by, by creating it there. The Spider Cube is a clever little device. It's, it's only a little, uh, it's smaller, about the size of a golf ball, I'd say. Um, and you can put it in a scene to get a sense of what the primary light source is. Um, so you get gray balance on your light side, on your shady side. You get a white level setting, a dark black setting and a black hole setting and a specular reflection. So when you go into your, your image processing application, you get a lot of uh, data on that. And I'm, I'm going to give you a link in a slide or two that uh, will go into that in more detail because we don't have time to go into all the possible uses of it online here. Uh, but you can put it in your scene, get a sense of the lighting, then take it out and take another picture, but use the data from the picture that uh, you first captured with it. 
So there are two articles here that I have links, and all these slides are going to be available on my website at the end of the talk, so you don't have to try and write down these things. They'll be clickable. Um, and also, Data Color is going to be, or is recording this talk, and it's going to be sending out an email to all the attendees by tomorrow, probably, with uh, access, so you get access to the recording, and you can see all these slides then, too. And that will also have the, the giveaway information, or the, or the uh, special offer information as well. So I've used the spider cube in the field a lot, and I've written a lot about how to do it. Um, so it's a it's a great tool. Now that probably what most people think of when they think of color management is is the heart of the exercise, which is calibrating and and profiling um, the display devices and potentially printers that you use. And spider uh, data color makes a line of spiders. Roughly speaking, Express gives you the ability to do basic calibration and profiling for your laptop, your monitors, for TVs that you use as a monitor. Uh, Pro gives you more options, more room for tweaking the profiles, and also ambient light measurement, so it can tell you, you know, okay, this is a pretty bright setting, you need to up the brightness on your monitor, etc. And then Elite, uh, the, the highest level product, adds projector support, uh, and also studio support, so if you have multiple monitors that you want to look the same, uh, studio is really, really helpful for that. I have, for example, two computers with two monitors each that I work on, and I, I try and keep all four monitors reasonably similar um, for my color, uh, color work. And then studio also adds printer profiling, which we're not going to go into in, in huge detail, but obviously if you do a lot of local printing, that's a great capability to add. Um, one thing I can't stress enough is a lot of people profile their computer at home and then they go out in the field or on a vacation um, or take a trip and they don't profile their laptop. And you can see in this picture, this is one of our African safari, photo safaris and we bring along a spider actually on those and make sure everybody's laptops are calibrated. Otherwise what happens is you start looking at your images and playing with your settings trying to fix a problem that may not really be there because a lot of laptops are not calibrated well at all out of the factory. Mac's better than PCs for the most part, but in many cases people would look at their images and think their camera was broken and it was simply that their laptop was not correctly calibrated and they weren't seeing the real colors. Um, so I, I, I would definitely stress uh, don't disregard your laptop, um, make sure it's part of your workflow. And then at home, maybe not every monitor, but every monitor you're going to look at photos on, um, you're going to want to make sure it's profiled. And then if you want to use more than one monitor for your photos, of course, Elite will let you do that. Uh, the, the good news is it, it's unbelievably easy. I mean, I've, I've been using color management tools for, well, really almost since they were invented. And it used to be you had to know a lot to do a color profile for your monitor. You had to answer a lot of awkward questions, you had to make a lot of settings. Um, with Spider 5, it's just unbelievably easy. For the most part, you can pretty much just go through the steps and take all the defaults. Um, I mean, you basically just have to tell it whether it's a laptop or a LCD or a projector, and it's going to do a really good job. So it's a, it's a great uh, system for doing that. And then you can look at the before and after image comparison at the end and, and see um, whether you've made, whether it looks like you want. So now you've got a color managed workflow when you walk through that process, but you need to take advantage of it in your applications. So first you want to make sure each computer has a profile set for each monitor. So profile chooser is a data color utility. You can check and make sure that each monitor got a profile set correctly, which Spider, the Spider software should do automatically for you, but you want to double check. You need to pick a color space, which we'll talk about, and then you need to use a, a applications which use color management, like Photoshop, Lightroom, Optics Pro, and FilmPack, the four we'll talk about today, and set them up, which we'll talk about. So the big decision you need to make in your color workflow, and it's not a permanent decision, and you can actually use more than one, but uh, you need to deal with color spaces. So color space is a fancy word for the total possible set of colors you can describe, or your palette of colors. 
if you make it very small, then you may limit yourself and not be able to render every possible scene that you've taken a picture of. If you make it too large, then your images are potentially going to be larger. We'll talk about why. Um, and you also need to post-process everything before you share it. So we'll talk about three options for working for color spaces, and, and each, each one will fit different people. There's basically sRGB, which we already mentioned, safest, smallest, the default. It has the smallest range of colors. Um, it's pretty much the color space used on the web. Um, so it's, it's really pretty safe. Adobe RGB is probably what most um, work-a-day professionals use. It's bigger, it gives you more color choices, and, but you can still use 8-bit images, which are smaller than 16-bit images. Um, and you just need to convert them to sRGB for web sharing, typically. Then there's Profoto, which is used by a number of fine art photographers, mostly. It's a huge color space. You need to use 16 bits per color per pixel in order for it to work correctly. Uh, so it's the most labor and space intensive, but if you're doing a lot of massive fine art and you don't have to process thousands of images, it's, it's a choice that, that some people take. Um, here's an example, you may not be able to see this very well on your monitor, of in the left, this is a color, very red saturated hot air balloon from our, one of our Burma trips, and Profoto can actually show more detail, more saturated reds than sRGB. So if I had a printer that actually could print those reds, I might want to keep that image in that color space. Now, if I'm going to share it to the web, it's pretty hard because the web is pretty much sRGB anyway. Um, I've kind of dramatized it here so you can see. But I've got an article on choosing color spaces on my website, which, which can give you more help with any of that. Um, we've got a couple different articles on. Um, this one's actually on the, on the data color site, and this one's on my site. So there's plenty of resources. Once you've done that, you need to implement color management in your applications, and we'll talk briefly about how to do that in each one. Uh, Lightroom, because it's a non-destructive raw processor, doesn't actually use a color space until you export. Internally, it uses a very large one called Lab, I think. But So when you export, you can choose your color space. And that's just really simple. If you want to create something for the web, you just tell it to S export and use sRGB. Uh, if not, then you can use Adobe RGB. Similarly, in Photoshop, the, which does write out files in an RGB color space, so in Photoshop you need to set your working space, and we've talked about how, why you might pick Adobe or sRGB or Profoto. Those are probably the three most logical choices. Um, you can tell it to convert everything to that space, or you can, if you do a lot of work for clients, you may want to not do that, so you keep things in the space the client uses, but it's simplest for most people just to say convert, but let me know when there's a mismatch in case you bring something in that you don't understand, and it'll ask you, so you can set those settings up one time, and then Photoshop will remember them. In Optics Pro and Film Pack, uh, all these applications actually read the monitor profile from the operating system. They didn't used to. That's another really nice feature. So when you make your profile in Spider, um, all the apps are going to automatically display your images color corrected. So here too, like Lightroom, you really only need to decide on export. And typically what I do is I use sRGB for my output JPEGs that are going to go to the web. Is Adobe RGB for the TIFFs that I'm going to further edit in Photoshop because it preserves more color. You can also set it to original and then it just keeps whatever the photo was tagged with originally or export any other profile. Like if you're going to a four color press or a particular printer, you can actually have it convert to that profile. Uh, similarly, DxO's film pack honors the metadata that's in your image and it automatically exports out to whatever tag you set in your camera. Now, if you print locally, um, and this is one of the places people make a mistake, you only want to apply your color profile. You want to use a profiled printer, but you only want to apply the profile once, and that's either in the printer driver or in the software. So you want to convert to your printer profile and then print without color management, or you want to let the printer do the work. 
So like in the Photoshop print dialog, um, you can select the handling you want. So either Photoshop will do the conversion to the print profile, or you can set it to printer, and Photoshop reminds you not to set both. So it's really easy. Um, rendering intent, the two choices are, that, are any, that are useful for most people are relative color metric, which basically does the best job it can of scaling the color spaces, or perceptual, which includes kind of a, an AI-ish system to try and figure out which ones look the best. Um, I would suggest experimenting with both because there's no way to know in advance whether per perceptual is actually going to be better for you. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Then gamut warning can be very helpful, this little box here. You see the gray area? That's showing that in this African sunset picture, my printer profile and my Canon Pro 100 cannot render the colors in that part of this image correctly. Uh, it's, they're too intense. So I can either go ahead and print anyway, in which case these areas are going to look like a flat patch of one color, because the it's or it'll if I use perceptual, it will try and map them into something else, or I can go back into Photoshop and attempt to uh, make the image, uh, bring the image's color down to the point the printer can render it, um, for which the soft proofing capability in Photoshop is really helpful. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a second. So that's for local printing. If you're going to share, to me the best solution is to use color management ser color managed services so I can upload my full image with my full Adobe RGB profile and these services will then do the best job they can of putting it out on their particular um, output device, like Photodex Pro Show is what I use all the time for slideshows. It's an amazing tool. Um, it can do slideshows. They have a web version. They have a, a desktop version. It can produce videos. And I can do high-quality HDTV projections when I do have a rich projector, but it will also color manage down to provide um, lower quality, lower color gamut versions if needed if the output device doesn't support it. Similarly, SmugMug is the one I happen to use for, for photo sharing, Zenfolio, and some of the other sophisticated ones do color management. Canvas On Demand, I use a lot for canvases, again, it's color managed. Uh, this is where soft proofing comes in in Photoshop. Photoshop can show you what an image will look like, kind of, um, with a given output profile. So you can sort of get an estimate of what it will look like on a particular device if you have a profile for that device. Now, if all this is complicated or you're not sure, if you're ever not sure, just convert to sRGB or use sRGB. That's the fallback. Everybody takes that. Everybody knows how to make it look good. So if you don't know if where you're sending it is color managed, use sRGB. The same goes if you're submitting to a contest or um, really to anybody. Um, you know, better safe than sorry. Oops. There we go. Um, so I have a couple articles on the data color blog about that, so a lot more detail than we can go into here. And also, if you want to go beyond the basics of profiling your monitors, um, there's an article I did recently for data color on using Spider 5 Elite to actually see how your monitor measures up and, and tweak it and, and make the settings on it optimal to get the best color um, for people who really want to, to do the best they can. So now we've got accurate color, hopefully, because we've got end-to-end -end color management. But for travel and vacation photography, we don't always want things to look exactly the way the camera recorded them. We're not trying to shoot a product shot to be realistic in a catalog. We're trying to make a pleasing memory. So we want to, in many cases, enhance that image. And that's what we'll talk about next. So we want color that's pleasing to the eye. We want it typically to be accurate enough so that it looks like a photograph, although obviously you can go beyond that and create just art or painting-like looks as well. Um, but creating a great memory or wall hanging is more important than the accuracy. We're not trying to be photojournalists at this point. We're not trying to be product photographers. Uh, we're trying to 
wow people or communicate something. Uh, so it's it's a it's a different skill at that point. We would like this the screen, the print, and the web to match. They won't always, and and I get this question a lot. Um, people look at something on their monitor and they print it and the print looks kind of dark and drab. Well, the, the monitor is shining light at you. So unless you print on translucent film and put a backlight in it, which you can, that's Fuji Trans and it looks cool, and you put it in a light box, you're not going to, it's not going to glow. Your paper's never going to glow. A metal print is pretty close. Um, you can do that. But they are, you do want them to, to as best as they can, look the same. So, that's what we're going to talk about, or that's kind of what we've done, making them look the same. Now we're going to talk about how we can improve each of them. And I'm going to talk about a couple different simple ways you can enhance color that are particularly useful for uh, travel and vacation photography. Uh, the first one is just simply white balance, which is how we can change the look of a photo from cool to warm, we can make the same photo look like it was taken in the day or the night, practically, um, just by working with our white balance. And the second, um, it used to be we called this saturation, because that was the only, the only weapon in our arsenal. But now, um, there's actually a more sophisticated tool in many of the imaging apps where they call it vibrance, and it's a more tone, tonally neutral version of saturation. It's an improvement on it. So if your app has that, um, it's a good one to use. And we'll talk about how we can we use that to enhance color contrast. Now, HDR can also be a color tool. Uh, it, it wasn't why HDR was invented. HDR high dynamic range imaging was invented to represent light, light to dark tonal range. But in fact, it turns out it can also do some amazing things with color. Uh, like this image on the right of our daughter by the Grand Canyon, I did an HDR and um, it really makes the color quite interesting, I'll say. I mean, it's, it's not good for every image and obviously you're not going to put it in a National Geographic magazine because it doesn't look photographic, uh, but it can be used to create some very interesting color effects. So here's the same exact image taken um, and then shown with three different white balance settings of the Golden Gate Bridge in this case. And this is one I did for an article outdoor photographer. Um, by moving the white balance from cool to warm and back, I can make that image look like it was taken on a sunny morning, on an overcast day, or in twilight. So the white balance can move the warm, cool versus the image. Uh, of the image, and it's it used to be one slider, now there's two in some applications. Uh, it takes advantage of the fact our eyes adapt automatically to the light color and our cameras don't. Now, your image starts with a white balance. If you're shooting with a smartphone um, and most default camera apps, you're kind of stuck. You're going to get the white balance the color picks. If you're shooting with a higher end camera, you're going to be able to set the white balance um, manually or if you shoot raw, and this is in my mind one of the very biggest advantages of shooting raw, the camera doesn't compute the, uh, computes the white balance, but the raw image doesn't have the white balance embedded. So after the fact in your application, you can change the white balance as much as you want. And that can be really nice because if the camera's not doing a good job of figuring out your white balance on the fly, you could waste a lot of time when you're supposed to be on vacation or you're supposed to be having fun or a ceremony's unfolding in front of you. The last thing you want to be doing is having to fiddle with your white balance all the time. So it's nice to have that later. Here's an example of a building lobby and um, this is a tool that allows you to see all the different permutations of white balance from the warmest to the coolest, and you can see how much difference it makes in the rendering of the image, and it just gives you an example of what you can do with, with really one little slider in your tool um, to change the color in your image. Now, it isn't always obvious what you want to do. Um, one of the tricky ones for me is uh, birds in particular against blue water or blue sky. Often, 
there's haze and everything looks a little brown like in this American Abbotset photo here, and the animal, the bird, looks nice and warm, if you will. Now, it doesn't show up that great on the, the web slideshow here, but I can then, I can cool the image down until that blue looks like a nice, beautiful blue, but then, you know, the bird may or may not look the way I want it. The, the, the red and the bird isn't as rich as before. So white balance isn't a one-size-fits-all. Um, sometimes one white balance is going to look better, sometimes another one is, and you're going to have to make trade-offs with an image or get more sophisticated and use other tools that, that are a little harder to work with. So speaking of other tools, um, the next thing that, that tends to make great color is contrasting color in one way or another. And there's, there's a few ways to do that. One is opposing colors. So you just get colors that, that clearly stand out against each other, like in this painted bunting from our Texas trip. Um, you get a, just a huge array of colors in the bird and then in the flowers. Um, so even though the whole image is lit fairly evenly, you get a lot of contrast, a lot of pop, and a lot of rich color. So uh, that's, a, that's a layup if you get that. It's like, great, you know, you're done. Um, we don't always get that. So another tool we can use is bright versus dark. It helps us, helps color stand out or saturated versus faded, and we'll look at some of those examples. So here are three examples of painted bunting images, and if you looked at any one of them by itself, you'd think, well, that's a pretty nice image of a painted bunting. It's probably the most colorful bird in the United States, uh, so there's not much not to like. But if you look at them compared to each other, obviously some stand out. So this one stands out, as we discussed, because it has really good color contrast. This one stands out because we've done bright versus dark, and anytime we can get a shaded background, that's a great thing. You can do this after the fact in Photoshop if you want, um, but obviously if you can sort of do it in nature, it's a lot easier to do it in the camera. Here, we've got neither. Uh, we've got a little, obviously we have some color contrast, but the colors aren't as contrasting, and the lighting is not as contrasty because the, the bird is actually as dark as the background almost, or darker than the background. So if you had to pick between these three, most people are going to pick one of these two where the bird color really pops. Uh, more examples of color contrast where you can work on scenes. This is a 12 millimeter ultra wide shot of Grand Prismatic in um, Yellowstone where I wanted to draw in these unbelievably rich algae blooms with this sort of orangey red and then you've got this sort of turquoise and the blue and the white. Um, so that I guess that's why they call it Grand Prismatic. I mean, it's got almost all the colors. You know, here we get the novice monks against the green and the brown on our Myanmar trip that we do every year, and it's just really, you know, it's really fun. The, the robe colors are such a nice contrast against the background, and you've got the sky. So uh, working on that kind of contrast in your images when you've got something you want to take a picture of on vacation, you know, look for a contrasting background. So some of the go-to tactics and some of the we've talked about, you can tweak the white balance, oh, that's a typo. Uh, you can increase the vibrance on a subject to just show the color more, or you can um, conversely, instead of increasing the vibrance in the subject, you can also fade the background. It's really the difference between the two that the eye catches. So you can do either one to make a subject stand out. And here's a good example of these moose. I mean, this is the same picture. I flipped it around because I, for the, the display purpose, I wanted the moose facing the other way. But I was able to take this picture and use a combination of vibrance and white balance and turn it into this picture down here, which is obviously much more striking because this was taken on a very overcast day with very flat light. Um, EDLs or everyday life photos are really, to me, one of the highlights of travel photography and vacation photography. And you can't always get the perfect sunset. This is Inley Lake in Myanmar we visit uh, every year. And it's an amazing place. And some of the sunsets are 
really colorful and some are not as colorful. Here's one where I got, to me, the perfect composition I wanted, this into fisherman, it says oar out, he's triangle against the mountain with the boat, uh, the sun setting, but the color just wasn't popping. So by using some of these same tools, I was able to create this photograph uh, fairly easily, which makes a huge difference. So now we're seeing a, a much more colorful and attractive image than we were before. Uh, it's still true to life. I mean, it's not, again, it's not photojournalism potentially, but that's not what we're trying to do usually with travel photography. We're, we're trying to make pleasing images that uh, uh, we can show our friends. Landscapes, similarly, um, this shot uh, is a park near us and I was waiting for a day where we had um, a beautiful overcast sky, but I really wanted to bring out the golden color of the landscape, which is what you would think of in a painting and the way your eye sees it, but the camera just wasn't picking it up. So I was able to do that by using these same tools. Okay, so here are a couple more uh, data color blog posts I did. Uh, one talks about how using uh, presets in different applications that reflect your, your color style. Um, and then the other one shows how to use some of these same contrast tools, uh, in that case, in wild, wildlife images. Now, one of the, the issues with any system like this is if your images don't look the way you want, troubleshooting is really your friend, is figuring out what's wrong. Um, otherwise, you can just spend a lot of time and money printing and not, not liking things. So we'll talk about um, some quick troubleshooting tips here. First, make sure your monitor is calibrated and profiled. If it's not, then you, you can't really tell what else is wrong is the problem if you don't have a color managed system because you're just, you're just guessing. It's just uh, trial and error. So that's really important that's, and that's the basis of everything. Now these are, uh, there's lots of things that can be wrong with images, but I'm going to take you through some of the most common ones. Often an image looks kind of drab and one very common reason for that is if your, your ISO, which is the, the film speed equivalent, except it's digital, is too high for that camera, which typically happens because the scene is too dark, then you're, you're, it's going to lose color. Cameras lose their ability to keep color contrast as you go up in the sensitivity, up in the ISO. And you won't always realize that because the ISO is typically set automatically on a lot of cameras. Here's an example from a very high-end camera, a Nikon D3, I think, of the same painting at a regular ISO and at a super high ISO. And you can see how, how look, drab it looks here, even though it's the identical camera, the identical lighting, the identical scene, um, complete with the color chart and all. Um, another thing you'll often see is you don't get a lot of color contrast if the light is too bright. Now there's a couple things you can do. If you're stuck with the image like this lion, uh, lion is hunting in Africa, you can throw a multiply layer on in Photoshop uh, or increase the contrast. And I described this in that article. Um, so I'm not going to go through it in detail here, but the blog article. If you haven't shot the image yet, this is a place where a polarizer can help you even midday by cutting the reflected light and giving you more contrast. Um, so low color contrast is often an issue with lighting. Similarly, if you've got a global issue where the whole image looks kind of geeky, uh, often the white balance is set wrong. Now, if your camera is guessing wrong, then you may have to set it manually and you may have to experiment or take a raw image if you can and then go into your image processing application and you should be able to change it later and uh, use like an eyedropper tool on a white or even tone gray area and that'll snap the white balance into, uh, into line for you. Another common problem is just poor light sources. Uh, this happens a lot with uh, indoor, most indoor venues unless they're rigged for television don't have lights that show up, that show things well on camera. Um, so 
any kind of indoor venue is going to give you trouble. Unfortunately, in, in many cases, there isn't a lot you can do about it. If, it's, if the subject is close enough, you can use flash. Um, you can try and move to a better lighting situation. If it's a true fluorescent, you might be able to use a white balance setting to fix it, but some light sources just don't have all the light you need, and they're just not, they're just not great for it. So there's a couple articles that go into more detail that I did for Data Color that are on the, on the blog um, that talk about each of those problems and some other ones because we didn't have time to go through them all here, uh, but you can find all those. Um, so that's what we wanted to cover. Uh, I wanted, if you want to learn more or uh, go on some photo tours, I offer a, a range. We do uh, Southeast Asia every December usually, and that's people, culture, temples. Texas, I do one or two every spring, which is mostly birds and some scenery. And then uh, Alaska every year would be my 16th year this year. Uh, we go up and photograph the grizzly bears and the puffins and the Cook Inlet, which is great fun. And then I, I do custom trips to Africa. I don't have any, any major trips scheduled there right now, but I'll do custom trips. So that's my plug where we go through a lot more. And we can do this in the field. I like teaching in the field because then I can actually see what the subject was, what settings you're using, how things are turning out. It's hard after the fact in a classroom if somebody brings in a photo because you don't know what it was like when they took it or what their options were or what else they could have done. So I really like doing it in the classroom. I mean, in the field, sorry. <laughs>